Hello, everyone. So I want to start off this week, or, you know, three weeks late, by saying sorry about the lack of posts as of late and the inconsistencies. And it's just because I've had a very, very, very busy schedule as of late. So I'll give you an update on my life before I move forward with next episode. So... I did go back to Beijing lately, and ever since I've came back to Beijing, I've had to get a new house, start a new job, and it's the job that's really, really gotten me very, very busy. So I've started mid-term in a high school, and in this mid-term, I've had to take over five classes, and basically all of my time has been around creating PowerPoints for these classes. So... Yeah, my fault, I'm sorry. It's just one of those things. I've been very busy. And then my wife, she lost a loved one in her hometown just as I was going to record an episode. So then that had to get put on hold. And yeah, the whole thing's just been a bit of a mess. But now we're settled in the house. Hopefully nobody's going to die soon. And now I'm settled in work. I'm in a routine now. So we can start podcasts again every week. Well, that is the hope anyway. So I just wanted to start the episode by saying sorry. And without further ado, let's get into the next episode. Alrighty, folks. And welcome to the Chronicler Podcast Channel. Episode 8, The Mandate of Heaven. So last time, we did look at the fall of the Shang and their replacement with the Zhou. Now the Zhou came in from the west in what was Chang'an, and which became the capital of the new Zhou dynasty. Now, the person who came up with this concept, where it was the Zhou's right to take over the Shang, is called the Duke of Zhou. That's the only name we have. We don't have any other name. It is just the Duke of Zhou. Okay? Now, the Duke of Zhou was the advisor of King Wu. And King Wu is the man who overthrew the Shang dynasty in the end. Now, the Duke of Zhou was actually King Wu's uncle. And he was like the mentor for the new king of the Zhou dynasty. So, like I said, the Mandate of Heaven was a reason to overthrow the Shang dynasty. So, before this, the Zhou were looking to the past within their own history, as well as every other history that they could, And they looked at the texts about Yao and Shun. Both of them didn't transfer power through families, but to the morally right person. And this is at the centre of these new ideas and the concept of the Mandate of Heaven. So when the Zhou overthrew the Shang, they argued that it was morally right, and that if you had a man like Shang Zhou Wang or Di Xin, as well as Su Daji in charge, you're probably right. So, the Mandate of Heaven was born with this thinking. And when describing Heaven, we tend to think of it as a spiritual realm that people will go to after death. That is in the West anyway. But in China, it's kind of different. The Chinese look to Heaven like it's a natural force. And and heaven is the operation of all living things, all life, all creation. Everything in the universe comes from heaven. It has the capacity to action humans. So heaven can bestow or withdraw its mandate to a ruling family. How do you get the mandate of heaven? Well, a good ruler will be granted heaven's mandate to rule. So basically, if you're benevolent, if you're kind, if you're just, 
but you're also firm, then you will get the mandate of heaven. As well as that, if you can win wars against your enemies and defend your people, you get the mandate of heaven. Now the person who will get this mandate is the ruler or the head of the family, so usually the man. And basically, when that ruler is bestowed heaven's mandate, the entire family has that mandate. That way, when the ruler dies, the living families can rightfully move on. So like the members of the family can rightfully rule in their place. Now the mandate, in essence, gives you the right to rule. It gives you legitimacy to rule. And it gives your entire family that legitimacy. Now, the only comparison that I can make to this in terms of the West is during medieval Europe, when the kings of medieval Europe were given divine right to rule by the Pope. But this is where it is slightly different, because the kings of Europe could do whatever they wanted. They had divine right. They had the right bestowed upon them by God, or by the Pope, who is God's representative on earth. Whereas heaven and China was slightly different. So heaven would only give you the mandate if you were good. Now if you start to turn into <laughs> the dark side, I guess, then heaven will withdraw the mandate. The way that I would describe it is basically like a contract. So heaven will give you a contract. And basically on that contract it will say, okay, you've got the mandate, but remember, you need to be a good ruler, you need to be a wise ruler, you need to be just, you need to be fair, and you need to be able to defend your people. So what happens when rulers start to stray away from this? Basically, in essence, the contract has expired. So now it is null and void. Heaven has withdrawn its mandate because you couldn't fill up your end of the bargain. So, basically, sometimes, well, every time this happened, a ruling family would start to abuse its power, they would become more corrupt, and the rulers would become more and more incompetent. And this is really, basically, the theme of every single Chinese dynasty moving forward. But how would the people have known that heaven has withdrawn its mandate? Well, there's a variety of ways in which the people could see, or maybe the officials could see, that heaven has withdrawn its mandate from a ruling family. For example, there could be natural disasters. So for example, floods. We know all about floods in Chinese history already. Freakish weather patterns. Crop failures, disease outbreaks, earthquakes shattering cities, or volcanoes erupting. As well as that, inside the borders of the empire, you could have peasant revolts. And sometimes these peasant revolts can get out of hand. And again, that would be a sign that heaven has withdrawn its mandate. And of course, you have outside the empire... So the outside influence, uh, spheres of influence for the ruling dynasties, they could suffer military defeats and they could have the incapacity to deal with these military defeats. So again, that's a sign that heaven has withdrawn its mandate. Now, it could be one of these things or one of these things that's a really big problem for a ruling dynasty, which then results in its overthrow, or it could be all of these things coming together, which makes um, the overthrow um, seem more like the logical solution. It really does depend. So now we're going to pedal back, just because I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, just because, you know, the Mandate of Heaven does affect every single dynasty in Chinese society moving forward now. This is what gets talked about in politics even today in China. So yeah, it's still a big deal. 
So if we go back to the Joe, like I was talking about, you could see how this would fit in very nicely with the Joe agenda. So, on one hand, you have the Shang, and Shang Zhou Wang, and his insane concubine, who would torture people for a laugh, they would enslave thousands upon thousands of people, and they would overtax everyone who wasn't a slave, and everyone was just downright miserable. And then on the other hand, you have the, the king of the Zhou, King Wu, and you have his great advisor, the Duke of Zhou. The two of them together, they were firm, but they were fair with their rule. They ensured everyone could live a decent life for the time, and they could make sure that they could balance their taxes properly, and they showed everyone that they had the military strength to defend them. So you could see how people would start to think, oh, wait a minute here, maybe the Joe are the right ones to rule. And on top of this, when it came down to it, the final battle between the Zhou and the Shan, King Wu actually said to his men that they weren't there on that day just because he wanted to usurp power. They were there because heaven wanted them to be there to overthrow the Shan. They were there because heaven wanted a new king. And it wasn't the Shan, it was the Zhou. Now, if you think about this, this is a new concept. So this would have been a huge psychological boost for your men. Like, what, we are not here for our leader? We are here for heaven itself? Yeah, damn right I'm going to fight. Now, of course, the Shang men probably heard it as well. And then that's when you have mass surrenders, you know, where people turn their spear upside down and say, I'm not fighting for this guy because I'm not going to go against heaven's will. You know, that could have played a huge role in the final victory, after all. And the thing about this speech as well, that we need to talk about, is that he goes on to say that the Shang themselves were legitimate at the very beginning of the dynasty. Because you had Tang of Shang, who was fair and just and kind and all of the rest of it. But as time has progressed, they have lost their mandate. And now you've got, you know... Shang Zhou Wang on the throne, who's a bit of a moron. Well, not a bit of a moron, but a tyrant. So now you could see why people would think, well, yeah, let's go with the Zhou. Now, the Mandate of Heaven itself, like the, the system that was put in place into Chinese politics after this, is really quite awesome, just because it's very dynamic. So, for example... If you challenge a dynasty to, like, for power and you overthrow them, then it is quite clear that you have won Heaven's Mandate. If you challenge the dynasty for power and fail, then it shows that you didn't have Heaven's Mandate. So it kind of gives you that legitimacy. If you've overthrown somebody, you go, well, yeah, I had the Mandate of Heaven. Duh. So you could see how this could play such a huge role moving forward. Now, to further legitimise themselves, the Zhou didn't actually kill everyone in the Shang family, which was kind of customary for the time. They let them live. They did relocate them away from their old capital as well as the Zhou new capital, but, you know, they still let them live. And on top of that, on top of letting them live, they could practice their old cultural habits, so for example, burning oracle bones, worshipping their ancestors, and even today, in modern Anhui province in China, some of these families can claim that they can trace their ancestry back to the Shang. And this is due to this kind policy by the Zhou all those thousands of years ago. So this could be like a bridge between um, us in the modern world as well as our past or China's past anyway it did like again like so like it played a legitimizing role for the Joe because you know they were saying oh yeah well hey look at us we're the good guys yeah this is the mandate of heaven 
And like I said, this played a huge role in uh, Chinese politics all the way up until today. And this was more like a supplemental episode and I realise it's turned into a 15 minute epic so far. So I'm going to leave it here. And yeah, thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you next time on the Chronicle Podcast channel. Thanks for listening.